Susan, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I've been a member, I think I had a lapse for a while, but I've been a member since the early 80s, and I was conservation committee chair for a number of years in the 80s. Then I left for Oregon, lived out there for 14 years, and came back and started to get involved again. So I, I really love this organization. As Tom Hotter and others have pointed out, um, this, I believe, is the leading environmental or conservation organization in Florida. So my question here is, why is Florida and the coastal plain in which it rests so rich in biodiversity? Now maybe this isn't the most important question. Uh, the most important question is, knowing that it's so rich, what are we going to do about it? Uh, yeah. Okay, and I'll get to that toward the end, I promise. Um, and of course, Tom Hochter and many other speakers have addressed that question. But you know, those of us who live here and get outdoors in the real Florida and experience native plants, native communities, know how biologically rich Florida is. But the significance of Florida on a global scale as the hottest spot within a global biodiversity hotspot is only coming to be recognized in, in recent years. And so we have a long ways to go. There are still many professional biologists, conservationists, and others in Florida that don't know about this broader significance. So I've kind of taken it on as my mission to um, communicate that and also explain these factors that have made Florida so rich so that hopefully we can keep these processes going into the future and keep Florida rich. Uh, let's see. It's not working. I guess I need... Okay. Did it actually... No, I did that. Oh, should I maybe point it towards you, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll try not to point the laser. <laughs> okay, so... Conservation biologists call biologically rich areas hotspots. And the term can be interpreted in many ways. But basically, biodiversity, no matter how we define it, is not distributed randomly or uniformly across the Earth. This is a, a fact of biogeography. Rather, it tends to be concentrated in certain areas. And these are what we call hotspots. It could be species richness, endemism, richness of families, whatever. Endemism is, I think, one of the most important criteria, perhaps the purest measure of conservation value because it signifies irreplaceability. I'm probably talking to you loud, aren't I? Yeah. Uh, okay. Irreplaceability. I mean, any species is irreplaceable, but when you have multiple species packed into a reasonably small area, that area, that region, is extremely irreplaceable. You lose a lot of evolutionary history when you lose areas chock full of endemic species. So protecting, center, uh, protecting threatened centers of endemism is a very, very high conservation priority worldwide. Let me try it. With that. Ah, that works. Yeah, it works. Okay, so um, this idea of global hotspots goes back to work by a conservation biologist by the name of Norman Myers, beginning in the 1980s. It was lately, it was after that, taken on by uh, Russell Mittermeier and others uh, under the umbrella primarily of Conservation International. It is now led by a group called the, um, a global a collaborative called the, the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, which includes the World Bank, the FAO, as well as major conservation organizations. But right now we have 36 hotspots recognized globally for a variety of criteria, but there are two fundamental criteria that any region has to meet to be considered a global hotspot. One, it has to have at least 1,500 species endemic to it, that is, found within that region and nowhere else on Earth. Secondly, it has to be threatened, as signified by at least 70% habitat loss. And again, there's other criteria that figure in, but these are the two fundamental ones. And these are basically all natural regions defined biogeographically as ecoregions, physiographic regions, geological regions, floristic provinces, etc. You'll notice just glancing at this map, I think, that most of these are tropical or Mediterranean climate regions. These tend to be the regions with the highest endemism on a global scale. But there are some important exceptions. And one of those exceptions, which is just barely tropical, is the most recently designated hotspot, the North American coastal plain. 
And this is um, based on some work by some colleagues and, and me, where we um, got to talking like, you know, I think we meet the criteria for a global hotspot. Why haven't we been designated? Well, no one has gotten around to adding up all the lists <laughs> and looking at the degree of habitat loss and actually making a proposal. So that's what we did. We published a paper in 2015 in the scientific journal Diversity and Distributions and submitted it to the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. And sure enough, we were recognized as a global hotspot. Well, what does this mean? Well, actually, CEPF provides funding to people working in regions that are biodiversity hotspots to pursue conservation activities. However, they have to be developing countries. And so it doesn't count for us in terms of getting money directly through the CEPF. However, our purpose in writing this paper was to get global recognition. And even though we might not receive funding directly, hopefully use this as some leverage to get increased attention drawn to the North American coastal plain for its biological values and more money for land acquisition and other conservation activities. So far, I can't say we've been too successful given the politics of today, both the federal and state level, but we're going to keep trying. <coughs> so there are a number of ways in which the southeastern coastal plain stands out in terms of its biodiversity. We've been a center of radiation or evolution of species for a long time. We've been a long-term climatic refugium, meaning the climate's been relatively stable over time, it has preserved many ancient lineages. We're more species rich and have higher rate of endemism than any other region of the United States except for the uh, California floristic province. And you're going to notice through this talk that we're in constant competition with California. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice this. We beat them on some, by the way. Um, our number of plant genera, 56, is only one or two behind California. We're right up there in terms of genera. And as I'll talk a little later, um, we're actually, we beat them in families. <laughs> we're among the highest fine scale plant species richest in the world. We've heard this yesterday, um, Susan mentioned it. Um, there's actually some plots in the green swamp of um, southeastern North Carolina that are over 50 species per <coughs> square meter, up to 52 vascular <coughs> plant species per square meter, which may be a world record. There's a couple that are very close in other regions, but it's right up there. But alas, we've lost a lot of habitat, more than 70% cut off for being a global hotspot. Um, we did for our paper a new analysis of habitat loss of primary vegetation. We've lost 86%, wow. only 14% remaining, and only about 4% remaining of pine savannas, woodlands, and various grassland types across the region. And by the way, these were once the matrix or dominant vegetation types. In the southeastern coastal plain, pine savannas made up originally around two-thirds of the entire landscape, and we're way, way down. Well, one reason that we haven't been recognized previously as a hotspot is that there are many long-standing myths and misconceptions about the ecology and biodiversity of the coastal plain. How many have heard this story that the forests were so dense in the eastern United States that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River and never have to touch the ground. Okay? I know I've heard it since I was a little kid. The first place I could find it in print is in Peter Matheson's wonderful book, Wildlife in America, first published in 1959. But I don't want to blame Peter. I think he was just passing on a story he probably heard as a kid. Well, let me tell you, at least south of the Mason-Dixon line, that squirrel would have had to take a very circuitous route to get from the Atlantic to the Mississippi because there were wide areas of open vegetation which contributed substantially to the biodiversity of the South. But there's many other myths. Okay, first, the geological youth, supposed geological youth, <laughs> unstable climate, flat topography, and frequent complete inundation by the sea precluded development of a rich flora and fauna. Well, the only one of these that is even partly true in that list I just gave is the relatively flat topography. <laughs> Everything else is wrong, but yet this has been assumed for decades to hundreds of years by naturalists and others. Secondly, it's been assumed that the climax vegetation of the coastal plain is southern mixed hardwood forest. That's the general term. 
Now, certainly, that is part of our native flora. Um, in fact, I did my PhD research in Upland Hardwood Forest in St. Flasco Hammock, shown here. But as Roland Harper, a very prescient early ecologist, showed in a paper in 1911, these hardwood forest types in Florida were limited to islands, peninsulas, steep ravines, sinkholes, and other places that fire couldn't get to. The native landscape, most of it was dominated by pine savanna. And finally, another myth that you still see today is that whatever fires occurred here prior to European arrival were lit by Indians. We now know that Indians lit some fires, but actually were a fairly minor component of the fire regime in the coastal plain, as opposed to some other regions across the continent. So, as for the youth of the coastal plain, parts of the coastal plain, especially the upper coastal plain, like the southern tip of Illinois and adjacent, you know, Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, where the Mississippi alluvial plain started to be exposed as the Cretaceous Sea started drying up in the late Cretaceous. Some of that has been continuously above water now since the late Cretaceous. So plenty of time for long-term evolution of taxa. So this painting here is not at all implausible. Um, bald cypress goes way back as a species, and Tyrannosaurus were in the southeast. And so we could have had a scene like that. That would have been pretty cool. <laughs> What's more, this, uh, this was new to me just a few years ago. The oldest terrestrial fossils in Florida date back to the mid-Eocene. I shouldn't hear, that's between about 44 to 56 million years ago. That's what that big M little a stands for, million years ago. Eocene. In fact, in some quarries just north of here, in the Gulf Hammock area of Citrus and Levi County, 21 taxa of terrestrial plants were found in the Eocene Avon Park formation in these studies. And here's a few of those fossil pollen grains shown there. Um, I highlight pines, oaks, and ephedra, which is Mormon tea, because taxa within these genera show a, a number of fire adaptive traits, suggesting that the environment back then may not have been too different from the one we have today. And now it appears that terrestrial habitat has been continuously available since the mid Eocene until present. Now, if you look at that upper left map, I pulled that off of Google Images a few years ago. But I've seen the same thing in textbooks, presentations, various other places, magazine articles. And what it suggests is that the, I can get the, the entire coastal plain was submerged during the Pleistocene interglacials, the most recent of which was 125,000 years ago. Now, if that were true, you would understand that, you know, we didn't have time to develop a really rich floor here. But it's not true. It's completely false. Um, in fact, sea level highs have been exaggerated for a long time. The most recent study suggests that, um, oh, let me go back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, suggests that the highest sea levels during the mid-Pliocene, which were the highest again since the early Eocene, were only around 35 meters, plus or minus about 15 meters above today's sea levels. Now that's high, obviously, yeah. but I mean, for a comparison, the highest areas in Florida, 105 meters in the Panhandle, 95 meters in the Central Peninsula, that's the Sugarloaf Mountain right outside Orlando, and we have a lot of area that's over 50 meters. So it appears that this habitat's been around a long, long time. Furthermore, some recent studies have overturned this idea that many of our endemic plants of the Lake Wales Ridge and other ridges in Florida only evolved during the late Pleistocene, during some of these high sea level stands and during the interglacials, um, when habitat was broken up into islands and these species evolved in isolation. Well, all that was important, but it took place earlier, it appears, than we've assumed. The first that I've been able to find um, detailed dated phylogeny of Florida scrub plants, these four species here, which are all considered full species at this point. They were varieties of earlier. But these all evolved earlier in the Pleistocene. They evolved somewhere between the Miocene and the Eocene. So somewhere, depending on the species, between, say, uh, 3 to 10 million years ago. So they're not recently evolved. They've been here a long time. 
So how does Florida stand up in comparison with other states? So high endemism signifies antiquity. That's an important thing to remember. Um, the first attempt to make a comparison in the United States among the states, and state boundaries are very imperfect. Okay, I'll show you some better maps in a second. But for historic reasons, the late great botanist Al Gentry, who died during botanical surveys in Ecuador in a plane crash in the early 90s, very tragic. He was one of the best around. Um, he did a comparison, and you can see here that California is the highest, followed by Hawaii, and then Florida. And he, in several paragraphs, pointed out how unexpected it is that a low state like Florida, that has presumably been underwater for much of its history, has so many endemic species. Today, according to Alan Weekly, who is the major botanical taxonomic authority for the Southeast, we have about 554 endemics or near endemics. Near endemics are not, at least 90% of the range within Florida, uh, within the state. So that's a lot. And the number keeps growing. Here was another study um, published in 2001, looking only at southeastern states, and unfortunately did not consider South Florida. So South Florida is left out here. But you can see that there are several hotspots. What happened here is um, the authors overlaid range maps of all species that were restricted to 25 or fewer counties. So narrow range species, what we call endemics, overlaid them and produced contour maps. And it stands out how Florida is the hottest spot within this southeastern hotspot. Okay, a, um, a better way to do this is to ignore uh, state boundaries and in fact look at a broader scale and define endemics in various ways and see how the pattern turns out. So the upper map includes anywhere from local single site endemics up to what we might call regional endemics. So these, is the, these are contour maps of all species with ranges of 50,000 square kilometer or less within a 10,000 kilometer square grid. So you can see Florida and surprisingly perhaps South Florida stands out because many of those West Indian species, um, which are uh, have small ranges to get into Florida, they have fairly small ranges, some of them in the Caribbean as well. So their global ranges are often fairly small. Um, and you can see, of course, that California also stands out, parts of the southwest, southern Texas. Even more interesting, the more uh, the smaller range species, less than 15,000 square kilometers, now you can see some really interesting patterns. Florida, again, the major hotspot in the east, but you can also see places like on the southern Appalachians standing out, um, other areas around, and of course California, again, standing out for heavy high endemism. Well, so far, um, I haven't really zoomed in on Florida, um, but now I am. Uh, the Florida Natural Race Inventory in their Atlas of Biodiversity of Florida looked at narrow range plants using what they call a rarity Rarity Weighted Richness Index, <laughs> overlaid them and identified seven major hotspots of endemic plant richness within Florida. Now, most of these are no surprise to you folks, right? We all know where these places are. Um, it is a little surprising, though, in general, that so many coastal areas stand out as having high endemism, including the Florida Keys. So for the mainland species, the species on the peninsula and panhandle, um, presumably these are either recently evolved or they are able to move landward and seaward to track shifting sea levels, which some must have. However, that wasn't a possibility in the Florida Keys. In the Florida Keys, where we have a number of endemics, um, actually especially among invertebrates, but also among plants and at least subspecies of vertebrates, the Florida Keys have only been separated from the mainland and from each other for about 6,000 years. So the most probable explanation for the existence of all these endemics within the Keys is that they evolved in relative isolation just over the last 6,000 years, which is extremely rapid evolution. Not unheard of, but pretty cool. So I've not talked specifically about age of species yet. I've implied that areas with lots of endemics are areas with long evolutionary histories that have been relatively stable over long periods of time. Well, this really stands out in this map. 
Here we're looking at an overlay of species that, of primitive dicots or pro dicots, those that are very ancient. And you can see clearly, blue is the highest, all right? So the Florida Panhandle, Apalachicola area in particular, but also the Atlantic coastal plain near to the coast, in fact, have a lot of these ancient genera. Um, and by the way, I'm species, I'm sorry, species in this case. Look at California. California has lots of endemic species, but they're mostly young. The only exception is up there's a little spot up here in the, the north, the Klamath Siskiyou region, which is a known climatic refugium. But otherwise, California's endemics are neo-endemics. They're relatively recently evolved within just the last few million years, whereas Florida, some of them go back tens of millions of years. Another way to look at antiquity is to look at diversity of higher order taxa, like genera, families, and so on. So here's a map of family level richness for the United States. Again, poor California. You know, how many, how many up? We, beat, we beat California all to hell on this one, don't we? Look at Florida. Okay, we have a lot of this deep diversity. Florida has more families of plants than any other state by far. And um, this is a native plant meeting, but I should mention, it's important to mention that in our paper we also looked at other taxa. Uh, we didn't look at invertebrates because invertebrate data is sketchy. However, we do know from various studies that aquatic invertebrates, especially those associated with springs and caves, have very high rates of species richness and endemism in Florida. Many single site endemics like that Orlando spider cave crayfish are found in Florida in just one cave. We also have um, a high diversity of and richness and endemism of uh, fish of various kinds across the coastal plain. Our actual species richness of fish is relatively low, especially in Florida, but high, relatively high rates of endemism. Uh, for amphibians, high rate of endemism. This is um, this species we just described, I think it was last year. Uh, it's in Florida and barely, apparently getting overlapping into um, Alabama. And then we have many, many species of endemic reptiles. You know, like the sand skink that's come up already. We have several species of mole skinks. And we have two, actually, species of endemic alligator snapping turtles recently described including one limited to the Swanee Basin, Swanee alligator snapping turtle. Among vertebrate, other vertebrates, we have only one full species endemic bird. We have several endemic subspecies, like, for example, the Florida grasshopper sparrow, but the scrub jays are only full species. However, that still beats any other state except for, alas, California, <laughs> which has two endemic birds. Does anybody know what those might be? Okay, Island Scrub Jay and, did I hear the other one? Yellow-billed magpie in the Central Valley. Okay. And mammals, we have um, Sherman's Shrew, and then we have the lovely Florida Mouse. And then almost, we have a near-endemic, the round-tailed muskrat, which is in Florida and barely gets into Georgia and no keeping up these home. So, that's the pattern. What explains all this? So, in the sciences of ecology, biogeography, evolutionary biology, a why question is essentially a how question. There's no ultimate cause, there's just mechanisms that led things to happen. We have a number of proposed mechanisms with abundant data supporting them. So I would put these beyond the level of hypotheses into the level of explanatory factors. We know now that the climate of the southeastern coastal plain has been relatively stable for long periods of time. So this has reduced extinction rates and it's fostered the retention of many of these ancient species, like that primitive dicot map that I showed you, the pro dicot map. Those are around because, only because the climate has been so stable for so long. And also it has fostered survival of newly evolved or neoendemic species. So these species, the fate of any new species, usually it's, it's a small, most of these are allopathic, they evolved in isolation, it's a small population. Most small populations do what? They go extinct. 
but the chances of going extinct are less in a relatively stable environment. So we have a large number of paleoendemics and neoendemics in Florida in the southeastern coastal plain. Sea level fluctuations did not wipe out our flora and fauna. They promoted speciation by isolating them on islands. Also, rivers played an important role in isolating populations of terrestrial species. For example, the two species of flatwood salamander are on either side of the Apalachicola River. Um, several regions contributed species to the coastal plain over time. I'll give one example of one of those major regions in a moment. But we've got species from the West Indies, from the Appalachians, from the Great Plains, from the Southwest, from the Neotropics, etc., all added to our richness. Species turnover along environmental gradients, we all know about that. You go down, up or down a few inches, especially like in a flatwoods or a dry prairie, and you're in a totally different community, different species composition. And then finally, and I'll go over some of these um, individually, frequent disturbance, especially by fire and wind, prevents competitive exclusion by those dominant species that are able to shade out subordinate plants or outcompete them for water or nutrients. And as a general global pattern, um, centers of endemism around the world are climatic refugia. The two go together. Um, Susan Harrison, botanist, ecologist at the um, University of California, Davis, and I organized a symposium a few years ago at Ecological Society of America. Uh, we published um, many of those papers and some others in the Annals of Botany, and we wrote a review paper. And it's very clear that this is a general pattern at a global scale. Now, the good news is that these regions, including the coastal plain, are expected to remain relatively stable climatically during this current period of rapid and dramatic climate change compared to other regions. That's great news, but still, things are getting so bad that we still could lose a lot of species. Not as many, though, as many other regions that have less climatic stability. And I, I should add there, um, I pointed out most of these other hotspots, these centers of endemism, are mountainous regions. There's only a few around the world, the islands and a couple coastal areas like Florida that are relatively flat but have high rates of endemism because of consistently mild ocean currents over long periods of time. We've got the Gulf Loop current feeding into the Florida current and then the um, Gulf Stream that provide fairly consistent temperatures and apparently these uh, currents have been operating for millions of years. Okay. So vegetation in the coastal plain, given this stable climate, has not changed that much. I mentioned some species going back to the mid-Eocene, now found in Florida even, that we still have today. Um, also a study, Alan Graham, now if you want to learn about paleoecology, I recommend Alan Graham's Late Cretaceous and, Cenozo Cen the, let's see, Late Cretaceous and Cenozoic Vegetation History of North America. Marvelous book. Okay. <laughs> But he describes, he describes vegetation systems in the coastal plain from the mid-Eocene, which he describes as very similar to what we find in Florida today. Moving forward to the, the um, Miocene, some of you probably know the famous Thomas Farm site to the northwest of Gainesville. This is an artist reconstruction of the environment back there about 18 million years ago, um, based on fossils of both animals and plants. And by the way, animals actually tell us a lot about the environment because you can tell from their morphology whether they were running around in the savanna as opposed to slithering around in a rainforest, for example. And we had a lot of savanna species actually going back to the Oligocene 30 million years ago, suggesting again, continuity of savanna as a major vegetation type over tens of millions of years. So, I mean, if you go out, you know, we all know pine flatwoods and sandals. This is a scene that we'd see today, minus the three-toed horses, unfortunately. <laughs> Moving up to the Pleistocene. So we have scattered pollen grains and plant macrofossils and vertebrate fossils in our rocks going back again to the Eocene, terrestrial fossils going back to the Eocene. However, we don't have a continuous pollen record until the late Pleistocene. That said, Florida has the best continuous fossil, uh, fossil pollen record uh, virtually anywhere in the world, going back now 61,000 years for our longest site, which is Lake Tulane, 
which is within the city of Avon Park on the Lake Wales Ridge. And there, the sequence goes back 61,000 years, and it's very informative. You see some cycles here of pine pollen. This is in green, so here's the present. Here's 61,000 years ago. So the width of the bars indicates the abundance of that genus, all right? So that's pines. These are oaks. Here's some others I won't bother with. Um, ambrosia, that's ragweed indicator of disturbance of various types. And this is poaceae, so these are grasses. So you can see that there's these cycles, but as the authors here noted, Eric Grimm and, Grimm and co-authors, um, including some of the leading figures in paleontology, there were no big changes in vegetation. They found no, no northern taxa within these pollen grains. All the same genera were there. Unfortunately, you can't usually distinguish species. There are fossil pollen DNA studies that can sometimes identify species. Those have not yet been applied to our ancient pollen. I hope they are soon because it'll answer some cool questions. But a lot of people, have, especially when um, our fossil pollen record only went back, say, 20,000 years, which wasn't that long ago that we had incomplete cores, people saw this recent uptick in pine pollen as indicative of Indians increasingly inhabiting the landscape <laughs> and burning the landscape, and some even claim creating the great longleaf pine ecosystem. Well now, with a more complete pollen record, we can see that isn't too plausible, because we had other pine peaks in the past just as high as the current pine peak. And again, there doesn't seem to be any dramatic changes in the overall vegetation, just changes in abundance over time. I'll come back to this a little bit later. Another reason our biodiversity is so high, as I indicated, is that we've got species from many different regions. And some of these are disjunct, meaning that the main distribution of the species that occurs in Florida actually occurs at some distance away. It may be just one state away, it may be all the way across the country. So we have a lot of these disjuncts in Florida. And it, can't, it doesn't have to be the same species, actually. It can be the most closely related species. There's a number of taxa in the southeast whose closest relatives are actually in, say, Arizona or California, or the Yucatan, for instance. So uh, tortoises, the gopher tortoise, is the last in a long lineage of tortoises that were in the southeast. We had giant tortoises larger than present-day Galapagos tortoises. A couple of different species up to the very end of the Pleistocene, in one case, in the case of one of those species, now extinct. Um, we have... Some really cool plant disjuncts. This is one that's um, a very common grass in the West. It occurs from the Great Plains across the desert grasslands of the Southwest down into um, Mexico, hairy grama, Udalua, Hirsuta. Florida has a few disjunct populations, some of which have been extirpated of this species. And this is a short grass. It, it's again, it's a, it's a grass of short grass prairies, desert grasslands. But in, especially at Cayo Casla, as shown here, it is the dominant grass in these coastal grasslands and savannas. Amazing place. Here is this western grass that has come to dominate coastal grasslands. These also occur at North Captiva Island and used to occur mm -hmm. on Captiva Island and even Sanibel, I believe, but have been wiped out. But we have a lot of these, okay? Animals as well as plants. Tortoises, scrub jays, crested caracara, white-tailed kite, brewing owl, diamondback rattlesnakes, our eastern separated from the western, which is its sister species. Uh, many bees and ignominoid wasps um, are disjunct between Florida in particular and the west. Harvester ants, 20-some species of harvester ants in the west. We have one species, the Florida harvester ant here, and which gets north to southern North Carolina. And then we've got a number of plants, the Budalua, a couple species. We've got Eriogonum, the buckwheats, Astragalus, Yuccas, Sisyphus, a weird species that occurs in Florida and southern California, Mexico. And a number of, of we're actually secondary peak of richness of cactaceae. Others are in the southwest, Mexico, West Indies. As well as a number of extinct species. And so the most compelling and now well-accepted explanation for all these western disjuncts in Florida is the intermittent but long-term existence of a broad corridor. We've been talking about corridors, right? Well, they can be very important on biogeographic and evolutionary time. 
the Gulf Coastal Corridor existed for long periods of time, then it would be interrupted, then it would reform, and allowed savanna and grassland adapted species of arid habitats to move west and inhabit, for the most part, the xeric habitats of our, of our deep sands, in particular, in Florida and other parts of the coastal plain. All those species I just listed. And of course, they get into some other habitats as well. But this Gulf Coastal Corridor was extremely important, especially in times of low sea level. As you go back on, um, that was my fault. I didn't. You can see how much broader the coastal plain was and how closer we were to Texas during the, um, inter or during the glacial periods when sea level was so much lower. Okay. Another thing, now moving from that broad biogeographic scale down to a landscape scale, I referred to this briefly before. We all know, as I said, you can walk up or down hill a few inches and encounter different suites of plants. Some overlap usually, but different suites. A really marvelous example was out of the Avon Park Air Force Range, if you can get permission to get in there. Um, you can see um, a progression that goes from scrub and sand hill down through Music Flatwoods down into this long seepage slope complex, which finally goes downhill into the dry prairie, the hyper seasonal subtropical grassland there, and finally to the riparian systems along the Kissimmee River. And so this gradient, just you know, very little elevational change. I don't know actually what it is, maybe a meter, two meters by the time or so by the time you get up to the scrub. But this very modest elevational gradient produces an extreme turnover in species. We call this beta diversity. Very, very high at fine scales in the southeast. And then the final factor I want to consider is disturbance. Now, the word disturb has a negative connotation in common usage. Ecologists, ecologists define disturbance a lot differently from the lay definition. A disturbance is something that periodically or episodically reduces biomass and opens up physical space, as opposed to a stress, which is something that more constantly limits the production of biomass. Now, you can have both going on at the same time, of course, but disturbances tend to promote biodiversity by reducing competitive exclusion, allowing more species to coexist in the same area by preventing the dominant species from taking over everything. Now, it's long been thought that well, the leading theory, I should say, is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, that some intermediate severity or frequency of disturbance, such as fire, will maximize biodiversity. That doesn't hold up too well in the southeast. In our pine savannas, in many of our other grasslands, as frequently as you can burn the site, the highest the species richness. Especially if you have some micro-refugia, some unburned patches, here and there, which most lightning fires and a good managed fire will do, which promote persistence of those species that require a somewhat longer time to recover after a fire. Okay? So maximum frequency at a landscape scale is probably the best way to maximize biodiversity for these types. And so it's very telling that approximately 85% of our plants that are endemic to the coastal plain are associated with pine savannas and woodlands and embedded communities such as, um, let's say, uh, depression marshes or cypress stones. In those landscapes, 85% um, of these endemic species are located. That's a lot. And these are truly fire-dependent ecosystems in the literal sense that if you remove fire, the ecosystem would change radically to another type. It would undergo what we call a phase shift to an alternative stable state. And it's no wonder that we've had such high fire frequency in Florida. Here is a map from the National Lightning Detection System. So as you get into yellow and then orange and then red and then finally violet, which you can barely see, violet is right over my house in Chile, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it is right over it. And that is 12 flashes, cloud the ground strikes per square kilometer per year or more. The orange is 8 to 12, okay, or much of the red. The orange is 4 to 5, 4 to 8. And so you can see the whole Mississippi Valley, the Midwest is pretty lightning prone, but 
especially parts of the plains, and then from Louisiana across the Gulf Coast of Plain, and then again in the Florida Peninsula is where we have the peak. There's only one other place in North America that has higher lightning flash frequency, and it's a relatively small area on the west slope of the northern Sierra Madre Occidental in northwestern Mexico. And it has almost twice as much as this hot spot in Florida, but it's a very, very small area. So a lot of lightning, and in those days, of course, prior to a sediment and conversion of the landscape, a few lightning strikes would start fires that burned over what are now several counties. They'd go on for hundreds of miles. Fragmentation of the landscape has prevented that, unfortunately, so now we need prescribed fires. So Cecil Frost, they have plant ecologists, fire ecologists in North Carolina, um, using a variety of sources, produced this map of fire frequency on the most exposed landscape positions, lightning exposed, so especially the lower coastal plain, one to three years, and then getting um, longer intervals as you move away from the coast or move northward or into the wet Mississippi, uh, Mississippi alluvial valley. And of course there were these refugia within that area that not, not shown at that scale. And of course a lingering question that I touched on earlier is whether Indians are responsible for all this fire. And many people have suggested that's the case. Um, there is a very compelling point made by Pinter et al. in a paper a few years ago, suggesting that humans are most likely to change fire regimes in regions that contain vegetation susceptible to fire, which means a lot of flammable vegetation, but which are ignition limited, which means very little lightning, no active volcanoes, etc. Well, that's not the case here, obviously. We have plenty of lightning and now plenty of human ignitions that we really don't need actually to use humans in the equation in looking at pre settlement vegetation. Lightning was more than enough to explain the dominance of these fire adapted or fire dependent ecosystems here. It, it may have been the case, again, prior to fragmentation of the landscape after settlement, that the landscapes were saturated with fire. You couldn't burn them more than lightning already did. Now, we know that Indians did burn some areas, but amazingly enough, and I really looked into this for my last book, read several books, hundreds of pages of archaeological and anthropological literature in addition to paleontology, there is no compelling evidence of lightning scale, I'm sorry, landscape scale burning by Indians in the lower southeastern coastal plain. With the exception of a few local areas, like around the chiefdom of Appalachia, a few other large village sites where they burn frequently for agriculture. But across that region as a whole, most burning was very, very local in the vicinity of villages, not across whole landscapes. So lightning apparently did the trick. So what kind of evidence might we look for um, to see if any region has a long evolutionary history of fire? There's really only a couple direct lines of direct evidence. One is charcoal and sediments in cores that you get from the bottoms of lakes or bogs, like Lake Tulane that I mentioned earlier. You can get charcoal. In fact, we do have charcoal in the Lake Tulane sediments. Oddly enough, though, there's a lot of times in history in various regions where if you do a core, for example, recently, where we know there's fire, you do a core, you don't get any charcoal for that period. It seems to be a quirk sometimes that you either get charcoal or you don't. Especially with surface fire regimes, they don't produce much charcoal, apparently, of the type that gets into the cores, uh, in these sediments of the cores. And so absence of charcoal in cores is not conclusive evidence of absence of fire. Another more recently used source is that this applies best to ancient soils, ideally more ancient than Florida's, are fire-derived chemicals, such as these poly polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are clearly indicative of past fire activity. And there's been some really cool studies just recently around the world showing this, but our soils really aren't ancient enough to show this. Most of our soils are very recent. Uh, despite the fact that we've been above water, we've had wind activity, dune formation, I mean, it's been a very dynamic place. Um, all of the other lines of evidence here are indirect, but when you have multiple lines of indirect evidence all pointing in the same direction, I think that's a pretty compelling explanation. So for example, we have ancient fossils of plants found today in fiery habitats. I've already mentioned some of those. We have ancient fossils of vertebrates associated with savannas, 
and other farm-maintained habitats. As I mentioned, we have that since the Oligocene, 30 million years ago. High species endemism in fire-maintained ecosystem. Again, 85% of our endemic tax are associated with fire-dependent pine savannas. High incidence of fire adaptive <coughs> traits, especially in the older taxa. We're filled with that kind of evidence. Moving up to the green swamp. This is a marvelous place. This is a place that has the highest recorded species richness at the square meter scale, 52 species at the very highest. And it's the ecosystem of the green swamp, due to local geological conditions and microclimate, Bob Peet, a very famous ecologist, has told me, it's, they're virtually identical, identical to the Apalachicola lowlands. It's the same kind of place, and you actually have disjunctions of species between the green swamp and Apalachicola, which is really cool. But in any case, study was done recently there. They had been burning for years annually, most years, sometimes every two years, and then they slipped back to maybe a three to four, two, three, four year, dramatic reduction in species richness. So basically annual or at least biennial fire seems to be necessary to maintain very high species richness in the savannas. And again, I at least add the caveat that these Fires should be patchy, like a lightning fire would naturally be. Not too patchy, or you get too much shrub, but naturally patchy, with shifting winds and so on. But even, again, as they say, even slight reductions in fire frequency can have dramatic consequences. And then we have pretty clear evidence uh, in fire adaptive traits. Now, it's virtually impossible to show that a particular trait evolved in the in response to any particular selective force, whether fire or drought or grazing or whatever, or competition, for example. However, when you have multiple adaptive traits in many unrelated species in the same community, in a fire-maintained community, again, that's pretty persuasive evidence that these are adaptations to fire. So, to be cautious, we say fire adaptive traits, but when we see lots of them in many unrelated species, I think fire adaptation is a fair enough use of the language. And also, it's important to recognize that species do not evolve and adapt in response to fire per se, but rather to a particular fire regime. So, if we alter that fire regime in terms of frequency, severity, seasonality, we're going to change the plant community and we could lose species. This, by the way, this painting is on my most recent book. Um, my favorite landscape painter, some of you know his work, Philip Juris. Unbelievable, he paints fire like no one I've ever seen in the world. Look up his website, he's absolutely amazing. Okay, um, next slide. So we have other adaptations. We have um, thick bark, the earliest known fire adaptive trait. It appears in pines in the fossil record. Um, back to 100, 126 million years ago. And what's really cool is that by 89 million years ago, two alternative strategies have already evolved. One being thick bark and branch shedding, which keeps fire from going into the canopy, which is the regime we see in our pine savannas and other frequent surface fire regimes. And then an alternative strategy of branch retention, intentionally, if you will, burning up the canopy, but providing heat to open stratus cones so they would drop their seeds. We saw that by 89 million years ago. This was a, um, a, a fossil-based um, phylogenetic reconstruction. But it's not only pines. We have pines around the world that show this trait. Also, a number of our oaks and other hardwoods. In this particular example, blackjack oak, at its base, the thickness of the bark is thicker, is more than the wood. It has more bark than wood. But that tapers rapidly because no need to have thick bark above the typical flame zone. You see? Because it's a waste. And also, they actually, trees do gas exchange through their, their stem, through their trunks. And so you're limiting gas exchange. You're using energy produced bark that you don't need as you go up. But the problem is, if you lengthen that fire return interval, you get up a lot of woody debris and you get a more intense fire that these species aren't adapted to, then they'll die. Because they're bark up higher that is not protected, as well as their fine roots and many other things that makes them susceptible. There's many other adaptive traits. I don't have time to go into them. Um, if you saw Milton Diaz's talk yesterday, 
gave a wonderful talk on underground storage organs, uh, which are common in savanna plants worldwide. And in North America, Central Florida is the epicenter of so-called geoziles, underground trees, underground forests, that have anywhere from like, say, 60 to 98% of their biomass below ground. They use that non-structural carbohydrate stored to re-sprout rapidly after a disturbance such as fire. We also have an interesting trait, again observed around the world, where smoke, or in some cases heat, stimulates germination of seeds in the seed bank. Um, in Florida, worked by Eric Mangus and his interns and colleagues, have identified so far four species, the ones you see here, that show this trait. Um, the substance has been identified, it's in smoke, it's called keratin. It mimics an unknown endogenous hormone that stimulates germination and growth in plants. And when, especially when rain carries the smoke down into the soil, contacts the seed, that when the seed opens up and germinates. Very cool adaptation. I'm sure we'll find more species. There haven't been that many studies so far. Of course, I think probably everybody here knows about the grass stage and longleaf pine. These exist typically five to 15 years, sometimes longer. There's several other pines around the world in the same kind of fire regime, frequent surface fire, that show the same adaptation. And of course, then they bolt upwards, and they can get 30, even up to 90 centimeters in one year. And so they can escape the flame zone of about around a meter in a well-burned savanna site rather quickly, which is why we can still get pine survival even in annually burned sites. And of course, the pinnacle of evolution and adaptation to fire is the ability to actually promote and facilitate fire and to spread fire across the landscape. Most of our C4 grasses are highly flammable, wire grass being a well-known example. Pine needles, fallen pine needles, are even more flammable. So underneath the adult pines, we get heat so intense that actually even some of those grass stage plants, lot lonely pines, are killed. And so that's why you see this patchy structure. Bill Platt and his colleagues have shown this. This un uneven aged mosaic of even aged patches, as Bill Platt has called it, in long we find savannas. Because underneath the adult pines, where we have a lot of pines, that those fallen pine needles produce an extremely hot environment and reduce survival of the juvenile pines and even of some of the grasses and other plants. But in the cats, where the pines, the adult pines aren't as close together, that's where you get the most regeneration. Really cool system. And it's not, <laughs> it's not just fire, of course. Um, anything that opens the canopy will promote this high diversity in the herbaceous layer, which is where our diversity is, right? I love the fact that Florida is all orange and red and violet on the fire map, and it's black on the hurricane map. And that is so cool. We are one disturbed place. <laughs> okay, I'm wrapping up now. Next slide. So in conclusion, it seems a combination of ignorance and bias has kept Florida and the coastal plain from being recognized for what it is, a global class, world class, global biodiversity hotspot. New information, um, especially from Florida, shows that we've been remarkably stable over a very long period of time. But in other ways, we've been more heterogeneous, are more heterogeneous than many people think. We're not just one flat, boring coastal plain. We have a lot of micro-heterogeneity, mostly at fine scales, that promote this biodiversity. The presence of so many narrow endemics, which we see here, um, many of them ancient, suggests that communities here are quite old. And this evidence contradicts the commonly held assumption that these communities were created by human activities, such as fires set by Indians. And then finally, my final point on this, um, you know, Tom Hopter talked about various ways that we prioritize areas for conservation in Florida. And I've been part of these exercises going back even before I lived in Florida. Since the 70s, I've been involved in prioritization and mapping, conservation planning. But I've gotten to the point that I think a place like Florida is so outstanding that the kind of growth that would be acceptable elsewhere simply is not acceptable here. We've had too much already. <laughs> Some 25 years ago, I read a paper by um, Paul Ehrlich. It was an editorial type paper where he suggested 
Simplest thing to do is no more development on natural habitat. I would add semi-natural because of some of our ranch lands, our range lands in Florida that are a mix of natural habitat, improved pasture, semi-improved pasture, and offer some of the best habitat, better habitat than our naked grasslands for things like crested carrot, carrot and burrowing owl, and are some of the best conservation opportunities in our state. So I suggest we make it real simple. No more development of natural or semi-natural habitat in Florida. So as somewhat of an advertisement, um, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, I go into great detail on most of the, what I talked about today in these two books. Um, University of Press of Florida is selling my book on the right at a huge discount, less than half of this price, next door. And that is it, I believe. One more slide. A goodbye slide. Uh, oh.